Welcome back to the Global Startup Movement. I'm your host, Angie Berkowitz. Thank you for tuning in. This week, we are joined by the legendary Howard Tolman. Howard is a serial entrepreneur, VC, and the former CEO of 1871. 1871, of course, is Chicago's center for technology and entrepreneurship, and has really played an integral part in helping to grow the Chicago startup ecosystem. On this episode, we talk about the story of 1871, as well as dive into Howard's new role as the first executive director of the Kaplan Institute for Innovation and Tech Entrepreneurship, based out of the Illinois Institute of Technology. The future of education is definitely an important topic and one that Howard is particularly passionate about, so I hope you enjoyed my conversation with him. And now I'll pass it off to Howard Tolman, the executive director at the Kaplan Institute for Innovation and Tech Entrepreneurship. Entrepreneurship has become a global phenomenon. Uncover the stories of entrepreneurs and investors worldwide. From Sub-Saharan Africa to Silicon Valley and beyond. Here on the Global Startup Movement. Now, here's your host, Andrew Berkowitz. So Howard, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, I would really love for you to start this off just kind of talking about what prompted you to uh, really make the transition from company building to take on more of a, a leadership role within the uh, the Chicago startup ecosystem. Uh, you know, I think that uh, the last 10 years, uh, really our focus, even though we were building companies, was on education. So when we started with uh, buying and transforming Kendall College, when we then went into Experientia and finally into Tribeca Flashpoint, um, all of those were schools. But the real goal was to look at a new kind of uh, school and a new kind of approach, which was experiential learning. It was much more focused on uh, entrepreneurial skills because you know I was increasingly convinced that uh, entrepreneurial skills were really life skills and that whether you were building a business or building a life, you were going to need to have those skills. And then when we sold Flashpoint um, to Laureate Education, uh, the mayor and the governor uh, sort of both, uh, you know, asked me slash uh, insisted that I take over uh, the leadership of 1871 and, you know, for the next four years, it was really about using a lot of the same ideas, a lot of the same thoughts to nurture instead of individual students to build an environment where companies could be successful. Um, and, you know, 1871 in those five years basically, you know, created uh, an environment in Chicago where tech is now almost 14 percent of the economy. It used to be 2 percent, created about 165,000 jobs. 1871 itself has more than 500 companies, about 2,000 people a day, and it's number one in the world. And so all of that felt to me like a very consistent transition from uh, sort of serving and, and promoting a single idea or a single company into building these environments where, uh, you know, you were really going to be able to support and help, you know, thousands of uh, entrepreneurs and really to help build the overall ecosystem. It's interesting. I think it's really at least seemed to me like the incubator and innovation hubs all around the world are more and more so becoming intertwined with with the universities, with the, the programming and, and curriculum in, in the local schools. You know, one thing I'd be curious to get your thoughts on, you know, as a community incubator space is it better to, to, to focus in your resources on maybe a, a select number of entrepreneurs and, and companies that are most promising? Um, or, or do you think it should be a model of just kind of spray and pray, get as many entrepreneurs, as many companies going through your programs as you can to make it more likely that you find that local success story? All right. Well, first of all, you know, to answer the premise, which is the university involvement with incubators, 1871 has all seven of the major universities uh, that are involved in the Illinois area uh, resident at 1871. So clearly uh, we believe in working with the universities and, and they 
believe that 1871 is a good solution because they want to check off all the boxes that you might imagine, you know, the entrepreneur box and the startup box and the innovation box. Um, so we work out really well for them. And frankly, the universities are not great at uh, innovation management. Uh, they're great at getting about halfway there, generating and imagining new ideas, inventing new things. But when it comes to bringing these things to market, you know, the professors generally are like, I'm going to publish my paper and I'm going to get my lab uh, refunded or get a new grant. And then they don't really want to go out there and mix it up with customers and everything else. So we at 1871 built a pretty good program where, you know, we would help them with technology transfer and with the commercialization of a lot of the ideas that were coming both from faculty and from students. Uh, and that, you know, I think it's funny because in the limited area of chemistry and pure science and let's say drugs, uh, they know, you know, a scientist or a professor knows exactly where to go. In the more general area that we're dealing with now, whether it's machine learning or AI or, you know, AR, VR, all these things, there's so many targets out there that they don't have a mechanism to bring their products to market, even if they were so inclined. So having said that, 1871 also has, in addition to, you know, grown up 1871, about eight uh, smaller incubators, which are, in fact, a little more along the lines of the second part of your question, which is more focused on specific areas where you have concentrations of dozens of companies working on education, dozens of companies working on uh, food or healthcare or um, IOT or things like that. So the first part of concentration was in fact to do it on a domain specific basis. And we've done a lot of that and you discover there are tremendous opportunities for lateral learning when you do that. We also have three accelerators. So 1871 is the landlord, if you will, for Techstars. And so we clearly understand the model of taking 10 companies as opposed to 100 companies and focusing resources on them, albeit the accelerators across the country are 12 to 16 weeks. And 1871 is typically 14 to 16 months in terms of how long a company is here as it moves through various uh, developmental and growth stages. Um, we're a nonprofit, so it's a little harder for us to be picky in the sense that if we're going to provide resources to all the companies, um, it's hard to say, and oh, by the way, we're really going to love these few uh, companies. But we, we've begun to do that in two ways. First, we have six or seven early stage venture funds here ourselves, and they clearly cherry pick what's going on here. But their success rate is probably not even as good as ours because VCs, if they're, you know, if they're the best VCs in the world, they might hit three out of 10 and the accelerators are not doing any better than that, really. But the second thing we're doing is creating uh, stepped up resources for uh, growth stage companies that want to stay here and have already sort of gone through all the 101 classes and workshops and opportunities. And so to that extent, we're doing what you described, which is we're doubling down uh, on the companies that are growing and progressing uh, without sacrificing the resources that we're providing across the board. But clearly, you want to do something. And, and, you know, this is an interesting issue, a separate issue, which is these mini funds that are popping up everywhere where some guys, you know, three entrepreneurs raise 10 million bucks and call themselves VCs. Um, we don't we don't think that model is going to be successful because the problem with the model is that uh, when you are called upon to double down on your winners, you don't have the, the resources to do that. Now, what a lot of these guys are doing is running around already trying to build their uh, second or third fund so they can do some follow on investing. But honestly, what we're what we're doing is, uh, in fact, focusing on uh, adding resources to support the companies that are uh, succeeding. The last thing I would tell you is that 
the other shift that we're seeing is going forward, technology is going to be even more at the center of the startups that uh, that are going to be successful within you know our systems, as opposed to technology being the enabler for a great marketing idea or stuff like that. Uh, you know, we're just not going to have you know twenty five more dog and cat you know dating sites or you know, services that'll send somebody out to brush your teeth or things like that. We're we're really seeing a shift toward substantive areas that are all going to have to have real technology sort of at their base. And I think that's going to change the game a lot too. Right. And I mean, I, I know you're, you're personally super passionate when it comes to ed tech and how technology, machine learning, all these new technologies can have an impact on, on education. And so, you know, one thing I'd be curious to hear from you on is really just where is the future of EdTech headed? Do you think that it's more of a disruptive force for the current infrastructure? Or do you think that it's going to be something, uh, you know, m- more complementary? I think that EdTech and healthcare are the two hardest areas that we're going to have to deal with. Um, I don't, you know, I think you you could actually see improvements in the way government services are provided more quickly than you'll see improvements in healthcare and in education, which is depressing, but it also is a comp, it's a comment on right. what low hanging fruit it is to improve, improve the productivity of, you know, government services. But what I would tell you is it is disruptive, <clears throat> but it's uh, going to take probably another generation in education to outlive and outlast the old teachers and when I say the old teachers, I mean the people that think that the way the technology should enter the classroom is that they should get a tech assistant or help with technology rather than learning and implementing the technology themselves. Having said that, we've got two or three companies that are absolutely already disruptive in the area of creating tools for personalized learning. And this is the big change, the big change at the high school level uh, is going to be differentiated learning where every student will have a device and it won't be one size fits all. And the, the teacher will be more of a coach with a dashboard seeing how the students are doing as they progress. Um, and some will be remedial and some will be extra credit and some will be working on, you know, par. But that's what the classroom is going to look like. And we're seeing a, a fair amount of that. Uh, being invented, and it's slowly being adopted. At the college level, <clears throat> it's going to be, I think, a different situation. I think that the top 30 most expensive colleges will continue to be, you know, completely elitist. And, you know, their only problem is they can't figure out what to do with the fact that, uh, you know, on the merits, uh, mathematically, they should have 40 or 50 percent of their class you know, be from China or from India, and they just can't live with that uh, scenario. So they have some, they're, they're going to have some really interesting challenges. The rest of the, the rest of the world, which can't afford the tuition uh, at these, you know, super colleges, uh, is going to have to figure out how to create a lot more of a connection between, <coughs> excuse me, what the students are paying for and what the implications are for them to actually be employable in the you know, digital future. And so they're going to have to change. I think we're going to see more and more vocational training. It will be high-end vocational training, but these are really the jobs that we're lacking right now. We're lacking people to fill those jobs. And, <coughs> excuse me, by and large, those are pretty good-paying jobs. And a significant portion of them are not exportable jobs in the sense that uh, they're not going to be uh, jobs that are going to be done outside of the United States. Yeah, I mean, I think it's tough because the structure of universities don't necessarily allow quick decisions to be made. And so I think that with how, how quickly this third wave of disruption is, is coming in and is going to change jobs, it's tough to imagine universities being able to, 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 to nimbly adapt well, their curriculum to, to what's changing. Yeah, well, I agree with that for sure. But here's the, here's the truth. About 50% of what 
kids are learning in school is not in school. It's after school. It's outside of school. It's, you know, extracurricular. Right. And I'll give you the example I always use about music, which is we may have stopped buying music, but we didn't stop accessing music. And that's going to be the same thing with education. Education in the traditional university mode is going to be so far behind the curve and so expensive that there will develop access and channels and delivery systems outside of the universities. And the companies will adapt to this by saying, all right, a diploma is one measurement, uh, but you know what? I'm going to do mastery testing. And if you know how to do this shit, I don't care whether you have a diploma or not. I'm perfectly happy to hire you because I'm looking for the people that can do the work, not the people who have a degree in marketing, but have never dealt with social media. I mean, it's amazing when you see how backward the marketing programs, just as an example, are in most of these colleges, because the faculty doesn't know how to teach Instagram and the faculty doesn't understand what's going on with Snap and with these different things. And so they're using books and media that are two generations back and the students are way ahead of them. But the, the truth is that all of the ways that they measure and keep score um, are not necessarily even going to result in training people that are employable in these industries. Right. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense to me. So talk to me about your new your new role with, uh, with Illinois Tech. I know you just became the new executive director for the Kaplan Institute for Innovation and yeah. Entrepreneurship. So I would love to hear, you know, one, one about your vision and two, just y- your thoughts on what about entrepreneurship is teachable versus just kind of going through the fire? Yeah. Well, for, first of all, with respect to the Kaplan Institute, the um, it grew out of my, my own decision grew out of, uh, you know, feeling that 1871 was now number one in the world, pretty well established, more of a management set of issues in some respects than a growth and creative uh, thing. Although to continue to be number one, 1871 is going to have to continue to grow and be uh, reinventing itself as well. But every single day at 1871, I had hundreds of people come in and say, geez, we wish we could find talented engineers who were also diverse, or we wish that we could, uh, you know, do dot, dot, dot. And, you know, I thought that there was a, that that was a little bit, uh, you know, hypocritical because right down the street at Illinois Tech were literally 8,000 engineers and scientists and computer, you know, uh, experts, uh, about 30% of whom every year are first generation college. So enormous statistics on diversity. Um, And they were right down the street. They were literally 10 minutes from downtown Chicago and nobody knew they were there. Nobody really was working with them or recruiting them or using them for internships or apprenticeships. And the the thing that uh, was particularly striking was if you are new to the whole system, if, you, if this is you're the first one in school that went to college and succeeded and became an engineer, my actual feeling and the, and the math shows this is that you don't get on a bus the day after graduation and go out to the West Coast. You know, you stay here because you're sort of like a local hero, as, you know, Springsteen would say. Um, and so so the thought that there was a pool of really smart engineers and computer scientists right down the street who matched this requirement for diversity was a good start. One of the things I believed is what I said to you before, which is that I think if you don't bolt on to those technical skills today, skills that are entrepreneurial, skills that are teamwork-based, skills that are interdisciplinary, uh, you know, some education in the process of innovation, I think you don't build the right kind of employees for the challenges going forward. So so the Kaplan Institute is about 70,000 square feet of space entirely devoted to training these students or bolting on to these students, entrepreneurial skills and innovation skills, both of which are scientific ideas. And to your point about can you teach it or do you have to be born into it? 
you know, to be sufficiently neurotic to be a successful entrepreneur, you have to have those genes. But having said that, if you take people who have the inclination, you can make them far better entrepreneurs by teaching them the methodology and the processes and all of the ways to go about being smart while you're, you know, building your business. So it's half and half. I think that we're what we're going to do is have thousands of students some significant portion of them are going to want to eventually build their own businesses, go work for startups. And the thought that they now are going to have access, in addition to their technical skills and smarts, uh, to entrepreneurial training and training in the science of innovation as well, which, by the way, is equally mechanical. I mean, innovation, as opposed to inventing something, Innovating is about taking existing processes and making them better and smarter. And that's a that's an iteration process. It's really something that you can reduce to a very practical set of skills. And if you stick to it, you become very, very successful at it. I mean, when we see these big corporations, most of the immediate lowest hanging fruit, most of the ways to save tens of millions of dollars has very little to do with rocket science and a whole lot to do with just putting in bots and putting in systems that eliminate hundreds of thousands of man hours that are just being pissed away at these companies. So how do we always finish off with a quick fire round, four questions up to 60 seconds each? How does that sound? That sounds good. Who's a startup CEO in Chicago that you admire the most right now and why? Well, we've got three. We got a sort of a newbie who's Mark Lawrence from Spot Hero, who I'm very excited about how Spot Hero is doing, and particularly the fact that they nailed it for several years before they scaled it, and then they exploded, and they didn't run into the typical growth risks that uh, many companies do. And on the other end is Eric Lefkowski, who is at Tempest, and they're trying to use DNA to really uh, develop some abilities to manage and cure cancer. So I, I feel like those are two extremes. You know, one, find me a place to park and two, save my life. But both of those guys are doing amazing work. What's the best tech blog or newsletter for us to keep up to date on what's happening in the Chicago tech ecosystem? You know, I think Built in Chicago is really good. And then Chicago Inno, I-N-N-O, both are pretty much on top of the stuff. And then John Pletz, who writes the tech column for Cranes Chicago, is is pretty much on top of the scene. What's your favorite business book and why? You know, I just read Scott Galloway's The Four, and about 80% of it was uh, the smartest stuff I've read in years. Scott teaches at NYU. He's a professor there. <clears throat> the 20% that I wasn't crazy about was you know, talking about uh, who's your head and who's your heart and who's your genitals and stuff like that. I He got a little uh, <laughs> philosophical for me. But in terms of his analysis of the impact of Google and Facebook and, uh, you know, the, the guys who are really driving the train, um, he's as smart as it gets. I'll definitely have to add that to my reading list. Sounds super interesting. But finally, uh, what's your favorite thing about living in Chicago? You know, Chicago is just super manageable. I mean, I, I lived for a long time in New York and Seattle. I mean, you know, I've traveled all over, but I find that day in and day out, the uh, this basically the quality of life is infinitely better than in any of the other three or four places that I would live for other benefits. You know, I, I love the theater. I mean, I wouldn't mind living in Manhattan, but you can't live in Manhattan I mean, I love San Francisco, the food culture and stuff, but again, you can't live there. And so in Chicago, you have a lot of the best of uh, all of those worlds, and you don't just have the daily grind of paying you know, $14 for a quart of orange juice. Awesome. Well, Howard, thank you so much for your time. We really appreciate you coming on the show. Great. Happy to do it. Thanks for listening. Be sure to add Andrew on Snapchat at and Burke. That's A-N-D-B-E-R-K. To see firsthand a day in the life of an entrepreneur in cities all around the world. 